everybody. My name is Vilma Vidanovic. Um, I'm going to talk to you about civil financial penalties imposed on private sector landlords by local authorities. But what they are, they are a very useful enforcement tool that local authorities have against private sector landlords. And they're entirely the creation of the Housing Act 2004, as amended in 2016. And they relate to only a number of offences which are set out in the Act. And those offences are failure to comply with improvement notice, failure to, to license an HMO, failure to apply for a selective licensing where you have designated selective license areas, or a failure to comply with one of the selective license conditions, contravention of the overcrowding notice, failure to comply with the management regulations in relation to houses in multiple occupation, a breach of banning order as well. So there's a, only six offences that it applies to. Now, the Renters' Reform Bill did seek to introduce, to widen these powers to include those under the protection from, offences under the Protection from Eviction Act. So unlawful eviction offences, harassment under the Protection from Eviction Act, Section 1. The Renters' Reform Bill had its second House of Lords reading on the 15th of May, but we know what happened about two weeks after that. Parliament's been dissolved, so this has been abandoned. So park that for now. We'll see what happens in due course. So why are these so useful? Well, they're useful because the local authority has powers to impose for each offence up to £30,000 as a maximum statutory maximum but the real stinger in the tail for the landlords is this and they don't see this coming you can have more than one offense at the same property and if you have a look in the handout page 45 <coughs> I give you an example of how this works so if you have one property one landlord that landlords chosen not to license that property and it, it is an HMO. There's six people living in it, sh shared accommodation, individual rooms, it meets the test for an HMO. The landlord decides not to license it, offence number one. Offence number two is that the landlords failed to comply with the management regulations which are imposed in respect of houses in uh, multiple occupation. So the example tells you breach of regulation four. Regulation four of the management reg regs requires um, reasonable steps to be taken for the protection of inju from injury, uh, means of escape, fire escape need to be kept um, clear uh, and uh, in order. So he hasn't done anything in relation to that. There's your offence number two. Offence number three is a breach of another regulation within the management regs, regulation seven, which is the maintenance of common parts. So something to do with the stairs, uh, maybe the lights on the stairs. So there's your third offence. And Regulation 8 is also breached, which is the maintenance of living accommodation. So they haven't kept the living accommodation up to standard. It's not in repair. Four offences, one property. Each of those offences can carry a penalty of up to £30,000. Now, it's not going to get £30,000 on each of them because it's to do with the seriousness of the offence, you have to look at the culpability, the harm, um, aggravating and mitigating factors and each local authority will have its own policy that it's devised and a methodology as to how to calculate these offences. So in this example, four offences, £67,000 penalty, that's not uncommon. And as a result of that, a lot of landlords are, in fact, quite outraged by this. And you can see why. Because if you have a property that's an HMO, you might have a rental income on that property of £20,000 a year to be then facing a fine of £67,000. It's quite an outrage reaction that comes. So appeals to the FDT are very common as a result of that because it does tend to take the landlords by surprise. But when they appeal, the benefits of appealing, um, or there are incentives rather to appeal, if I can put it that way, because when they get to appeal, it's a complete rehearing. So they get to go again. They get to argue the point yet again. And the uh, first tier tribunal that hears the appeal looks at it afresh. 
the local authority has to prove the offence beyond reasonable doubt again. So they have to get everything in order, front load all their evidence and present it in order to prove the offence. Built into the statute is also a provision which says that the FTT can take into account matters which weren't known to the local authority when it made its decision. So what that means is the landlord doesn't engage with the local authority prior to the penalty being imposed or post. They lodge the appeal and then they bring a load of evidence for the first time and the FTT says, yes, that's fine, we'll consider that. It doesn't matter that the local authority didn't know about it. So the first tier tribunal then decides to either quash <laughs> the decision entirely, the penalty, affirms it, or what often happens is if for the landlords, and this is still a success for them, they decrease the penalty. They can, however, increase it also. They have the powers, which also tends to take some landlords by surprise um, when they do appeal. And it's not uncommon for these to be increased after an appeal. Um, but a success for a landlord obviously is a reduction in the amount of penalty that they have to pay. And the other incentive, I suppose, um, or lack of disincentive, is that there are no costs in the FTT. So even if you appeal and you lose, you don't bear the costs of the other side. You, you don't pay the local authority anything unless you've acted unreasonably. And just because you have a rubbish appeal does not amount to unreasonable conduct in the FTT. So the points that are commonly taken on appeal are that the offence is not made out. Um, so the landlord can't, sorry, the local authority can't prove it against the landlord. Now that isn't that common because the local authority will get good evidence and they'll front load it and they'll be able to probably prove the offence. What tends to be the more common issue is that Ah, you might prove the offence, but I had a reasonable excuse for not complying at the time. So it's the reasonable excuse defence, which is a complete defence to quite a lot of these um, offences that are um, prosecuted. The second area where appeal points tend to arise is technical points regarding the process. And the Housing Act, Section 249, and in fact the Schedule to the Act, Schedule 13A, contains quite a prescriptive process as to what you need to do as a local authority before you serve the Notice of Intent, when you serve it, what you need to include in your Notice of Intent, and then when you're serving the final penalty notice, what you need to include in that too. So it's that procedure that's often raised by the appellants as being... Um, as there being a fault with that and they're trying to argue that that somehow invalidates the whole process. So those are the technical points raised. And then lastly, which is almost always raised and thrown in, the penalty is too high, it's too disproportionate, um, it should be less or nothing. So those are the three areas where it tends to, uh, t the, the FTT tends to concentrate on. Um, since the introduction of these um, in 2016 and onwards. By 2020, there started to be quite a lot of upper tribunal decisions. So since 2020 or so, in the last four or five years, there have been quite a number of upper tribunal and court of appeal decisions, in fact, dealing with these points. So what I'm going to do is highlight some of the more relevant ones for you to look at and if this ever comes across your desk and you want to know where to go to this should be a pointer towards those um, relevant decisions. So the first one is Sutton Norwich City Council and this was a court of appeal decision about the status of that local authority policy. So remember when I said that the local authority devises its own policy as to how to implement these penalties, how to calculate them, what to look for, what's the methodology. Initially, when, as I say, these provisions were introduced, there was some uncertainty as to the status of that policy. Should it be followed to the letter? Is there any discretion to depart from it, etc.? And this was the basis um, of this appeal and what the Court of Appeal said is the starting point is you do look at the local authority policy. You attach weight to that policy if you're considering this in the FDT. But you can depart from that policy if there's disagreement with the conclusions but the burden is on the appellant 
persuade the FTT to do so. And when we come to the end of this talk, you'll see an example, a very good example of a departure from a policy. The next Court of Appeal case that looked at the general approach, the, the, the process more generally, was to do with the fact of looking at the new evidence that's come to light that wasn't known to the local authority at the time they made their decision. What this concerned was facts which arose after the decision was made by the local authority. So not only was it not known by the local authority at the time, but it couldn't have been known by the local authority at the time because it wasn't in existence. That state of affairs wasn't in existence. So does the provision which allows for the FTT to take matters into account extend to anything and everything irrespective of when it happened? No, it doesn't. Anything arising after the decision is not relevant. So any state of affairs that comes into existence after the local authority has made its decision is not to be taken into account on appeal. So that's a, a, a simple point, but a useful one to understand the process. Moving on to those procedural deficiencies that I was talking about. And this is one of my favorite cases when it comes to this jurisdiction, because this is a bit of a get out of jail free card for local authorities. Um, the case of Eunice, upper tribunal decision, it provides a cure for a lot of procedural deficiencies that might arise. So if, if you're for a local authority, this is the one you want to be armed with. Um, this case concerned a notice of intent. And remember, I mentioned again, the prescribed steps that need to be taken, what needs to go into a notice of intent. Um, there were some issues as to what was contained within it. And the facts aren't important of Eunice. It's the, it's the conclusions reached. And I've set them out in quite some length in your handouts. So you can read those at your leisure. But the point uh, of that is that an overly technical approach to compliance shouldn't be adopted. There should be some flexibility. You should look at the language of the legislation. What was the intention of the Parliament? Did Parliament intend for the non-compliance to be such that if you don't comply with it, it completely invalidates everything else that you do? If it didn't, and if there are other procedural steps or procedural safeguards in place, which can be relied on to make sure that the whole process is fair, then there aren't any issues really. Um, so the appeal uh, there wasn't successful. The, the aim is to look at the whole scheme in the round. Another example of that deals with um, the adequacy of reasons given in the CPN. So again, the reasons need to be given in a in a final notice or indeed in a notice of intent as to why you're imposing this on the landlord. And this case of Wang in the upper tribunal again, follow the same principles, the same affordability, the same flexibility can be afforded um, here because there were a number of other documents sent to the landlord along with the notice of intent. So you don't look at that just, just that one document. You look at all the correspondence leading up to the service of the notice of intent <coughs> and look at whether the landlord knew what they had to do to comply, by when, who to contact, come and discuss it with us, etc. All of this was relevant. Um, so essentially, look at it in the round together with all the documents that have been served. Address for service of various documents is a, a point that arises. And there are two recent cases from the upper tribunal, both from this year. Uh, one was um, Tabasam against Manchester City Council and the other one was Newcastle City Council and Abdallah. They both concerned the provision of section 233 of the Local Government Act, which says you can serve at the last known address. Any notices, you can serve those at the last known address. The local authority in both those cases had a last known address. One was obtained from the land registry documents in the case of Tabasam. The other one in Abdallah was obtained from the selective license application that came in. And the service point was fine, in the sense that that's what the local authority knew the last address was, that's where they served. Procedure's good, service is good. However, in Tabasam, 
what was argued was, well, you, you procedurally might have served me in that the section says you can serve at my last known address, but the notice wasn't brought to my attention. This was an improvement notice in this case. So if it wasn't brought to my attention, how can I comply with it? And therefore, I have a reasonable excuse for not complying with it. In Tabasam, the upper tribunal said, yes, you do. You have a reasonable excuse for not complying because you didn't know about it, despite service being good. In Newcastle, um, City Council in Abdallah, this was slightly different in that at first instance, the, the validity point was determined and that went on appeal and the FTT never considered the reasonable excuse point. So it's gone back to the FTT to reconsider that point. But they left it open saying, you could argue this, let the FTT decide once you go back. The, the point though that arises from Tabasam and it's something for local authorities to bear in mind is whilst you can get your service sorted by your last known address, you might want to dig a little bit deeper just to find where the landlord is so that you can bring it to the landlord's attention because otherwise you might be facing a reasonable excuse defence argument. And talking of reasonable excuse, the burden is on the applicant to show that he or she has a reasonable excuse and that has to be proved on a balance of probabilities. And that's the case of um, IR Management Services Limited and Salford City Council. You've got that in your handout, an upper tribunal decision. So a, a good authority to, to know about that the burden is on the uh, landlord. This particular case of Adel Catering and Westminster, again, upper tribunal decision, that deals with when a reasonable excuse defence can be established and particularly in relation to those cases where you've got a breach of a licence condition or a breach of a condition imposed in <coughs> management regulations that requires the landlord to, for example, ensure reasonable steps are taken or where the wording might say you must um, ensure the reasonable safety of the occupants or keep it in repair at all times, which you'll know from Section 11, but that's sometimes repeated in some of the other um, regulations. The facts of this case, again, are not so important. It's the discussion about how to approach whether an offence is committed, and then secondly, whether the reasonable excuse defence is made out. So you need to look at the words that have been used. What is the landlord being asked to do? Is it a requirement to perform a number of activities to take reasonable steps irrespective of whether you get to the end result and achieve the result as long as you've been taking the steps or is it to ensure a state of affairs and outcome irrespective of what you do before that so is it a relative obligation or an absolute obligation and that's what you need to to think about as a local authority in terms of proving the offense but also when considering whether the landlord has a reasonable excuse defence. And as I say, the, um, the, the handout contains a, a lot of the discussion, and I've cited it there for you, so it's worth having a read through that. The next case, I won't go into any detail about, it is just an example, a very good example, albeit fact-specific, of what the landlord had to do in order to establish that reasonable excuse defence. To what lengths did the landlord have to go before they were able to establish that they couldn't possibly comply with the condition? And that was to do with the tenants hindering the process uh, and what steps were being taken by the landlord to try and deal, deal with that. So again, that's set out in the handout for you. And then we get to what tends to occupy the FTT quite a lot of the time in terms of the calculation of the penalty. <coughs> You'll recall I said at the outset, invariably this will be raised as a point on appeal, that the penalty is too high, it's too disproportionate. So the FTT is asked to look at it again and recalculate it, essentially come to its own conclusion as to what it should be. The case of Hussein is useful 
and two points arise in respect of that. The first one's on page 60 in the handouts, and it's the, it's the first paragraph I've cited from it, and it's the approach to looking at determining how, what's the seriousness of the offence, how serious is it? Because depending on how serious it is will determine the starting point for the penalty, and then you might move on to putting extra uh, I increments on it due to aggravating factors or you might start reducing it because of mitigating factors. And the guidance given in Hussein is that you look at the serious of the uh, seriousness of the offence with reference to the culpability of the offender and the harm or the risk of harm that arises from the non-compliance. The second issue which often is raised by landlords is that well we've we've done the works albeit late but everything you asked us to do initially we've now done it we're not really that culpable can you reduce the culpability and what Hussein said was no you don't look at culpability <coughs> in that way you look at the culpability at the point of the commission of the offense if the landlord then decides thereafter to carry out work albeit late that's a mitigating factor which we will apply at that stage, not at the initial stage of looking at culpability. Um, so that is a, a simple point but a useful point because, as I say, very often landlords will try and raise this um, in the FTT. In your handouts on page 62, I've referenced another case of Leicester City Council in Morjaria from the Upper Tribunal. That's a later case, and it tends to suggest a slightly different approach as to how you look at the seriousness of the offence. I've got to say, I don't understand the decision. I've looked at it a number of times. I've reread it and read it. I've discussed it with numerous, well, quite a few people in this room, actually. I still do not understand why it's suggesting a slightly different approach. Um, it seems at odds uh, to me because it's suggesting you, you were you look at the seriousness of the offence first, somehow, in, in its own context, and then you look at culpability, and then you look at harm. I thought the whole point was that the seriousness is assessed with reference to culpability and harm. You've got to have a point of reference as to how you assess the seriousness. So I've set it out for you there. It is used often uh, by applicants in argument. Uh, my view would be follow Hussein. And if you understand what um, Majaria says, do let me know, please. <laughs> and then finally, and this case of, of Kazi um, and Bradford City Council is the example of when the policy has been departed from. And departed from quite significantly, I would say. Um, my view is that this opens up a can of worms um, and it creates uncertainty regarding how you calculate the offence, the, the penalty. So in, in, in this case, what was discussed is how you apply those increments or decreases for those uh, aggravating or mitigating factors. So every local authority will have a policy where they will either impose a flat percentage increase for each aggravating factor and by a same percentage decrease for each mitigating factor. Some local authorities have a, a policy that's devised on a points-based system rather than a percentage, but Bradford applied a flat 5% for each, um, each mitigating and aggravating factor. So an aggravating factor could be previous enforcement action has been taken against this landlord, apply 5% as of course. They didn't cooperate with the investigation. There's another 5% applied. When it comes to mitigating factors, the landlord could say, well, the tenant caused some of the damage, so I couldn't really sort it out in time or I was trying very hard. Well, that's 5% applied as of course to reduce the penalty. There's been no previous enforcement action against me. This is my first offense. There's another mitigating factor, 5%. Or the tenant prevented access on a couple of occasions, which meant that I was slightly delayed and therefore technically committed the offence, but it wasn't really my fault. Again, another 5% perhaps deducted. But should each of these carry the same 
should they be more or should they be less? And that's what Kazi was all about. And what they said was that, no, they shouldn't carry the set in stone 5% for each and every one of them because you need to look at, look at it in the round. Um, and what they said in this case, if you look a, have a look at page 64 in the handouts, they reduced one of the penalties for the <coughs> failure to comply with the improvement notice by 25% because of the fact that work had already been carried out. Now note, not all the work had been carried out, some of it, most of it, but there was still work not carried out. Regardless of that, the tribunal thought 25% reduction sounds about right. On top of that, we're going to apply a further 20% because the tenant played a part in causing the disrepair and the tenant made it difficult to do the work. So a 45% reduction in the round for those mitigating factors. So the rationale to me is sound, obviously. You have to look at the circumstances. It has to differentiate between those who do a lot post commission of offence and those who don't do a lot, surely. And, and that, that makes sense. But how do you calculate it? And that's the issue I've got with the decision in Kazi. It doesn't tell you where they got the 25% from, how they came up with it. It doesn't tell you how they came up with the 20%. There were some other offences that they dealt with as well, and that's even more difficult to understand how they came up with it. Came up with it's in your handouts. But as an example of why I think this causes uncertainty, is because it doesn't tell the local authorities how to calculate. So what do the local authorities have to do with their policies? Should they do anything? Do they need to amend their policies or not? Um, I don't know really what the answer to that is all I would say is that cars is telling the local authorities that they can afford themselves a little bit more flexibility uh, when they come to look at imposing these penalties mm -hmm.